you so much for joining us today, uh, InterNACHI's webinar. Um, this one is specifically on how to inspect decks. This is the second time that we've done this. It is a series for New York State credit. Um, this webinar is approved for three credit hours um, in New York State. If you hold a license in another state other than New York, um, just let me know by email. I've put my email in the chat box. Um, but to get your credits for New York State, as soon as the webinar is over, um, and I would encourage you to do it tonight rather than waiting until tomorrow because life happens, email me your name as it appears on your license number and your license number. I will be going tomorrow through the webinar, um, and I basically have to calculate how much time that everybody spent. And so long as you were in the webinar for 90% of the time, um, so like if your connection drops and you hop right back in, no problem, um, I will be able to submit your credits to New York State. So again, my email is my name, Kayla, K-A-E-L-A, at internachi.org. Um, and you don't need to remember that because once again, I put this in the chat. All you need to do is send me that information and we will get you handled. Um, Lon, um, I know that this might be a little bit more challenging for you because I won't be here, but remember that people may be asking questions in the Q&A box. Yeah. Um, so when you get to good pause points, maybe just minimize your screen and take a look so that you can address it, make sure that if anybody has any specific questions that that can be answered. Sounds good. Okay. We'll, we'll, well, see. we'll see how I do with this. Maybe uh, AJ can help too, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's always a new experience, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but I think with that, we have kind of slowed down on the participant numbers. A few more people might hop in, and I hope they do, because I think basically they've got like a 10-minute window. If they're past 10 minutes, then they're really not going to be able to get credit, although there's a ton of good information here, and it is worth your time. Uh, so with that, Lon, I'm going to leave it to you. Um, you know, let me know if you have any questions. I will be around kind of offline just you know, yeah. for a couple more minutes, but otherwise, yeah. I trust you. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're uh, going to be discussing uh, deck inspections. Fairly, uh, you know, straightforward stuff, but there's definitely some stuff to know. Uh, one thing about decks, um, as uh, you can see on that slide, uh, InterNACHI estimates that about of the 45 million existing decks, only about 40% are considered safe. You know, uh, it says there 90% of the deck collapses occur as uh, the deck separating from the house. That, everything you read, whenever you read some account of people being injured by deck uh, failures, it's nearly always the deck coming away from the house. So one of the big things, if <laughs> nothing else on a uh, deck inspection is checking the attachment of the deck to the house. Obviously, if it's two feet off the ground, eh, not uh, maybe such a big concern, but when we get up you know, six feet off the ground, people can get hurt. When we get up around 10 feet, then people can really get hurt or worse from uh, decks coming loose. So, you know, interesting thing here on this slide, uh, this is an InterNACHI uh, slide, uh, you know, inspection tools. Yep, flashlight, you know, sometimes particularly decks that are low to the ground and uh, sunny day or the sun's on the other side of the house or something, flashlight uh, certainly helps. Occasionally a measuring tape, uh, ladder, mm, well, you know, for a tall deck and you've got to get up close to look at something on the, uh, maybe looking, probing for wood rot on the joists or the uh, ledger board, then a ladder uh, can be useful for reaching those things. I haven't used too many levels. I've never used a plumb bob. I definitely have used a probing tool. I have a big flathead screwdriver that uh, it obviously use it for screws on usually electrical panels, but it doubles as a nice probe. I've never used a hammer on a deck. 
I uh, can't remember using my moisture meter or magnet or a calculator, but uh, you know, uh, conceivably situations where those might be useful. So um, the, uh, you know, it says here, inspectors should start at the bottom and that's certainly good advice. You know, walk underneath it for obvious reasons. I mean, walk underneath it if you can, but a tall deck starting underneath it can make more sense because you can get a sense of if it's even safe to go on top of it when you're underneath it. Uh, you know, in the real world, you just walk out on the deck wherever you, you know, when it <laughs> kind of works with the way you're moving around the house. But from a practical point of view, if I look out on the deck and I just it looks like amateur hour, going around the house, out the basement, whatever it takes to uh, get underneath it where I can see what's going on underneath it is a common sense thing to do. Interesting thing here that uh, in that diagram you see, people tend to gather at the edges of the deck. Uh, so you're going to have greater load there. So decks, the IRC provides kind of designs or instructions for construction of decks with that in mind. Most decks designed for loads up to 40, 60 pounds per square foot, snow loads, uh, 50, 60, 70 PSI, uh, PSF, um, 40 PSF live load equivalent to a 200 pound person standing in every 2.5 feet by two foot, you know, essentially, you know, almost a little over a four square foot area. Uh, that's a lot of people standing on a deck and, you know, you get a bunch of people standing on a deck, kids, let's say, dancing, then the deck better be pretty stable if it's more than two feet off the ground. The um, hot tubs, you know, if a hot tub's going to be put on a deck, there needs to be substantial engineering for that. And as a home inspectors, we're not engineers, but we're absolutely looking for signs of stress, something going on that may indicate that this deck is not doing very well with a hot tub on it. You get underneath it and want to see either the joists closer together, some doubled up, some evidence that they have um, planned for this extra weight with a hot tub on it. So starting out with footings, the exterior deck footings should be installed at least 12 inches below the undisturbed ground surface. Well, of course, how can we ever know that? We can't. So we just go by what we see. We would like to see that concrete pier peeking up out of the top of the ground because we don't like our wood posts sitting down in the dirt. Even if it's treated, cedar, redwood, whatever, sitting in the dirt is an opportunity for uh, organisms, and maybe in some cases termites, but organisms in the soil to get into our wood and start to deteriorate or rot it. But just for your information, if you're in a cold zone and the, uh, where there's a frost line, then that pier, that concrete pier that the column, wood column typically is sitting on should be at least 12 inches uh, below that frost line. The, uh, so, so for the obvious reasons that frozen soil, water, that means there's water in it, water expands when it freezes and that expansion can push things around. If that pier is below the frost line, it's not as susceptible, or the bottom of it is 12 inches below the uh, frost line. If we, we get that freezing in action in the upper part of the soil, it's less likely to push that pier around and cause us some problems. So the best pressure treated wood for ground contact is classified UC4A. Again, as home inspectors, it's sometimes pretty hard to know if you have if the wood column you're looking at is truly classified that way. One of the little clues is if you see those little 
uh, horizontal indentations. Looks like you know somebody rolled a uh, something across the, the face of the wood, creating this little pattern in it. That is sometimes the uh, higher rated wood. They do that so that the during the process of impregnating the wood with the uh, with the preservatives, it penetrates deeper into it. I know some wood columns that I bought for a uh, uh, little elevated uh, platform I was doing some years ago. I bought the rated for ground contact, and that is one of the visual things, physical things that I saw on those columns that was different than just regular pressure treated lumber. In any event, in our illustration here, we also see the seven foot rule on steep properties, the slope of the ground uh, where the, I mean, you got the, the deck sitting there that you sh there should be seven feet between the footing or the pier, uh, the bottom of that pier to where it daylines down that slope. So you got the pier that down here on the slope and out here at least should be seven feet away. Once again, as a home inspector, we almost have no way of knowing whether that rule is truly being adhered to. So we're just looking to sit, but it's kind of nice to know that that's the guideline. And what we're looking for, is there a problem? This illustration here shows the post down inside the soil. Yeah, you know, take my big screwdriver, I dig around it a little bit down into the soil, a couple of inches, see if there's any evidence of deterioration, wood rot, pests, whatever. And then is our column still vertical? Has it slipped down the slope or moved in any way? Of course, you'd be looking for that on any inspection. So we're just looking for the evidence that there's been a problem, but there's like next to no way for us to know if they actually installed a footing as in the illustration here, appear properly with it being the proper depth drilled deep in the, into that slope properly. Um, this one you know, shows these little concrete bases that you can buy at Home Depot that's popular for columns. Uh, you know, these are, you know, okay for, or can be okay, let's put it that way for decks that are, you know, 12 inches off the ground or something. But for decks that either you know, very large or, uh, or, or well off, high off the ground, then we actually want to see those sitting with concrete with some sort of piers that are well anchored in the soil for stability. So <clears throat> this one here, uh, the image shows that the uh, post to footing connection. In other words, the base of that column or post needs to be anchored some way to that top of the pier. In this case, we have a bracket there doing it, uh, which is a common way to do it and certainly easy for us to verify. But you know, you just grab hold of the pole column or the post and give it a push. If it moves, it got a problem. Uh, if it doesn't, and we see evidence that we have the anchorage there, Probably okay. Uh, so this one, kind of interesting, right on the edge of the pier. Is this so? And by the way, you can see these little marks here indicating it might be the higher grade of wood preservative on it. As you can see these little rectangular, yeah, rectangular marks on it for the, uh, to drive that wood preservative deeper in it, but not a guarantee that it's actually the higher grade of preservative but a possibility that it might be. Uh, so here we have a nice bracket. Looks like it's secured good. But you notice the edge of the column is right off the edge of the pier. Mm -hmm. Knowing what your local inspector likes to see can help you out on this. In some areas, man, the inspectors, the city, county inspectors, whoever the authority having jurisdiction that's inspecting this stuff, wherever they are, they uh, want, to, some of them want to see this column here right in the center of the pier or fully bearing on the pier. And some of them will not even like this edge sticking off. In other places, they're gonna be good with it. 
but you know, look, some sort of just do it yourself or sort of board just stuck in there on another board sitting in the dirt. It's not even plumb. You know, is this is a cantilever to boot here that, that they're using to try to add some support here. We got a lot of things going wrong here. And this one is not going to be acceptable. By the way, the out of plumb kind of rule of thumb is one inch out of plumb and eight foot of height of that column. And this can be true of a lot of support uh, columns that we see in typical residential construction. In other words, half inch out in four feet, a quarter inch out in two feet. So considers to be, we it's kind of considered to be unstable or on the edge of uh, losing stability when we get out of plumb more than an inch in an eight foot height. <clears throat> you know, you can get some goofy things here that, uh, you know, may be working. You know, this one here is probably some supplemental support, but it's not under our uh, beam there. Uh, kind of the, got the three two by tens or whatever they are uh, loosely nailed together, not loosely, but nailed together, secured together. You know, this one kind of on the edge of okay. Uh, it has supplemental support, but we've got a column, a pier under it. So it's probably not supplemental. It's probably being used to actually support something. You know, well, you know, it all should have been over here and underneath this. You know, you have to kind of look at this stuff and go, eh, we got these blocks over here that are, you know, kind of just sitting there. They definitely have a supplemental support to them. So you have to sort of kind of get under there and sort of evaluate exactly is this, is it doing anything? Is it making a difference? If it is, then is it put together the way we want it? So the IRC does not say a lot about post sizing. But uh, tall four by four posts are vulnerable as they dry, humidity changes, heating, cooling changes, but humidity changes more, mostly to twist under load and can kind of change the profile, so to speak. So one of the changes uh, or at least re strong recommendations is as the American Wood Council recommends in their deck building prescriptions is six by six are just what you should be used uh, or should be used for deck construction period. Uh, you can notch those, they're just a lot more, uh, they split, they still got a lot of wood there. So they tend to be more uh, resistant to giving us trouble. So the desired column certainly in the last 10 or so years, is that bigger six by six column or post. And certainly if you're going up 10 feet, eight, 10 feet, gotta be six by six, no, just has to be. Um, the, also you see there that uh, you can go up 12 feet, but if you can go as hot without any cross bracing, but if you go further than that in height, then 14 feet has to have cross bracing and really shouldn't have a deck more than 14 feet off the ground with just columns supporting it, wood columns supporting it. The, um, so one of the things that, you know, we're always looking for is evidence of wood rot, which typically is fungus growing in the wood. The fungus, the mycelium, which is kind of like the roots of fungus, will break down the cellular structure of the wood and weaken it, of course. So, you know, that probe we were talking about at the start, I use a big screwdriver. You know, you see something that looks susceptible, and, or I see something that looks susceptible, and I just stab it with my that probe, uh, with my big screwdriver. If my screwdriver goes into it like a piece of styrofoam, you know, probably got some wood rot. Um, if it bounces off of it, we're looking pretty good, but there are some subtleties to this. One thing you see over here on this uh, uh, photo on the right, we have a wood column disappearing down into the dirt. 
And, you know, look, you know, first of all, we want our wood columns out of the dirt. So just going to write up earth the wood contact every time, even if the column, and they mostly are, is pressure treated, it's still going to go, hey, don't want it in the dirt, should be above the dirt. So I'm going to call that out as vulnerable to possible wood rot, but then take my probe, uh, my big screwdriver, dig down a few inches and just check to see if in fact I see some evidence of some wood rot getting started or well established even under in the part of the wood that's under the surface of the ground. So, and we can see it on planking, on the on depth planking too. The ends are the most vulnerable, you know, they cut these ends or when they, the ends are just cut. And, you know, that's a great place. Water gets in there, fungal spores get fungus growing. So we, this is a very good spot on wood planks to see some rot. And sure enough, you see my screwdriver disappearing into the end of that plank, showing we got some wood rot going there. And then here we are looking at the ledger board on the underside. And so one of the clues here, even though they freshly painted it and kind of hit it, but you see how it's a little swollen there, puffy looking almost. So it's not that flutes flat finish that a typical two by 10 or two by 12 would have uh, that we see down along this part of it. Get up here and you can see how it even kind of swelled up, shall we use that word, swelled up around the lag or bolt that's attaching the ledger to the wall there. So that ding, ding, ding rings that little bell and oh, maybe we have something going on here take the probe, sure enough, disappears into it like a piece of styrofoam, we got a problem. Also got a nail pop over here and stuff, which are some other issues, but wood rot on a ledger board is a big deal. Oh, look at that. Ha! Even got some mushrooms peeking out down here, even more. So whether, even if, you know, my screwdriver didn't disappear into this, I would see these mushrooms poking out down here. And mushrooms and fungus, wood rot, the three right together, same thing. And we would still have something to call out. So it's a combination of, of things here with the first giveaway, maybe the mushrooms, depending on which way you're looking, or the swelling here, probe going in, seeing the mushrooms, putting it all together, definitely wood rot. And obviously a ledger board, pretty hard to just replace a ledger board and leave the deck there. I mean, you're typically talking, pulling the deck and putting a new ledger board in, big job, basically a new deck. So <clears throat> recognizing wood rot, definitely something to be attuned to. So here we see this little white splash is peeking out here, got a little lichen and, and this is kind of a, a, a algae, that's what I'm trying to say, algae growing here. Those don't necessarily damage the wood much, but this white here is the sporing bodies of the fungus in the wood kind of in its early stage over and over i stab these places with my probe and it doesn't go in at all just think right there but nevertheless i know what this is it's that start of wood rot and it's our indication that now that the clock is starting ticking on this deck and depending on your location your climate your uh you know humidity average humidity how warm, you know, those sort of things, you know, uh, things like this can, you know, in a dry climate may take uh, five, six years before we have extensive wood rot that, that is just truly weakening the deck. In a humid, um, warmer climate, it may only be a couple of years. But this is our first little clue that the uh, time clock has started ticking on this deck and it's coming. So then again, we see some sporing bodies poking through or 
on the surface here. And again, a little bit about how I often do this, just, you know, in a report is just, you know, I put in my circles, my little description here, just to show to a, a client that this is what I'm talking about. Again, same thing. You can see it kind of runs in grain in the in the grain of the wood frequently. Again, we had a little algae growth, uh, that green going there and stuff. But the whine is our big concern here under this uh, synthetic planking on the decks. But they used regular fur or a soft wood joist here, and we got it going here, getting started. A little more advanced. Now it's a little scalier. So instead of looking like a little splash of white paint on it, now we got a little texture and scale to it here. So now you see that white kind of getting three dimensional, so to speak. And this is st the start of our uh, mushrooms, so to speak. Well, not so to speak, it is uh, getting going here. And so this is that next stage the um, sort of the I don't know from early to mid uh, mold or uh, not mold but fungus development in our framing so you can see it's in the planking here but it's also edging into our joists and so it's it's weakening both as it is progressing here and then here, same thing, but now you can see it's a, that because it's got, it's more than just that whitewash, we have that three-dimensional look to it, got that sort of scale on it, and now it has started damage or weakening the wood. This bo overall board here is not close to failure, but we do have wood rot starting to work its way. A screwdriver disappears into that area there. Uh, this area down here might not be quite as deep, but that is telling us it's coming. This deck may not be unsafe today, but it's on its way. This is a big write-up. On the surface, from that edge, it's been working its way through the board, and now you can easily see it. You don't even have to probe that one there. Here, same thing, chipping out. So this is in the planks. Underneath, uh, we have uh, put in some sort of plywood uh, filler here for something on top, and it is getting rotting away, spreading into the joist, our uh, rim joist here, spreading into that, getting, uh, again, that wood rot that maybe it hadn't weakened the framing yet, but it's coming. Another way this can sometimes set up is those uh, fungal uh, mycelium will grow in the softest part of the wood following the grains here. So you get this white stripe, stripe, striping, I'll say it right, striping running along here. And then here it's uh, <laughs> it almost looks like a, a, a little bit like efflorescence on concrete. Um, but again, that's that sporing bodies. This is well in the development of it and getting the uh, uh, damaging into the uh, wood uh, joists here. Whoops. Okay, mushrooms. Well, that's easy, isn't it? Uh, you see a mushroom, you know you got wood rot. Just simple as that. If it's advanced far enough that mushrooms are growing, you got a problem. Uh, this is that same photograph from earlier, just a detail on the mushrooms. Uh, then we talking about this while ago, lichen and algae, you know, giving that green color, sometimes some other colors, but the white there, those little white lines, that's almost certainly our fungus growing there. And yeah, you probe it and it go, doesn't go in, but still make a comment the evidence of early rot or early fungus and uh, wood rot in the, uh, in the deck. So moving along. Uh, so this image here is uh, 
again, as it says, depicts the best practice of keeping a minimum of 12 inches. The, in other words, the beams are the, uh, should be at least a minimum of 12 inches above the dirt, the joists a minimum of 18 inches. You know, look, people build decks just however they can. They don't pull the dirt away or scrape it away. And at least in my experience around here, inspectors, as long as it's not touching the dirt, they're gonna, they're gonna say it's okay. So yeah, this may be a best practice, but unless you're in an area where your local inspectors are truly enforcing this, then you know, you're not, I just not, I'm not gonna call it out if this is three inches above the grade here, because I know that my local city inspectors aren't gonna call that out. So here, and there's been some changes uh, in the most recent code book, uh, the IRC, on how beams, girders are attached to columns. So the image above shows a girder improperly relying on the lag bolts. So they don't, one of the changes is they don't want these bolts, even if they're half inch bolts, they don't want these bolts being the source of support for the deck up here on the column. They want that beam to be bearing right onto the column. And they want that to be a six by six. Remember we said this a while ago, six by six minimum now for columns. So yeah, you can notch that six by six column, have this beam fully bearing on that column and then bolt it through to uh, secure it to the column or the post here, but giving you that bearing on the column. So we have that straight line of bearing all the way through to the ground. So over here on our example, pretty nicely done. Um, they um, accept this is a, uh, this, except it's a four by four uh, column. Oops. So, four by four columns. So this is an older before the code change, but still they have brackets holding things together. They uh, had this bearing well. So look, pre-code deck, a pre-code change deck where four by four columns were still being used. We're just gonna look at it and go, is it working? Or that's the way I treat it, is it working? In this case, it's working, I'm gonna be happy. The, um, and don't have a complaint here. But for newer construction, we want to see a six by six for our column here. Okay, so here, relying on the bolts to support our four by four column or post here. So we, you can see the, the load transfers across. So we have this offset in the load. It's not a direct straight shot down. And then make it even worse. Our installer, his bolts were too short, so he countersunk them in. And so the bolts must be on the surface of our joists here. And you cannot countersink them in because it means we just we just lost half the wood that our that we're relying on for our strength here to on our vertical load. So several things wrong with this that we have the load shift not directly straight line on the column. The uh, bolts are countersunk into the joist here. So several things to write up, amateurish for sure. Okay, maybe not failing, but not a, um, a construction done to the uh, guidelines. So over on our left, good, fully bearing through, has brackets securing it and locking it into place. This would be nice. This once upon a time might've been allowed, but now because the columns are on the side, notched four by fours, can't do this. If these were six by sixes notched with this fully bearing on it, 
this one would be okay. Um, and butt joints should be bearing on a column instead of out in space. So that also is a, this is a butt joint here, obviously. So that is also something that would be undesirable, not right, not right there. You guys, you, you know about notches and stuff. It applies to so many things. Uh, Lord Joyce, for instance, right off the bat and things. So it's not much or any different in deck construction. So not the big thing is notches are not permitted in the middle third of spans or on the tension face that are uh, greater than three and a half inches uh, thick. So the uh, that's uh, just one of those things you see some you know, deep notches or cuts out in the middle of a joist, beam, whatever. Yeah. That's something to call it out, even if they you're not seeing a failure resulting from it, it's still something that you want to make a note of and call out. A little bit more about that. The uh, notches and solid lumber joists and beams must not be greater than one sixth the depth of the, uh, of the uh, joist. The must not be longer than one third of the depth, which uh, where's our D here we go. Oh, no, that's our, uh, that's a hole. Where's a D3 here? Anyway, um, geez, I'm not seeing it on the diagram. L um, must not be located in the middle one third of the span. So, as we saw in the early, er, earlier slide, we don't want notches out in the middle third, period. And notches at the ends must be less, this one here, uh, D4. So, the um, and by the way, holes in general should be two, at least two inches from the edge of a, uh, oh, there you go. No holes within two inches of the top or bottom edge. So you don't want, and that goes for putting in uh, lags or bolts on like on a ledger board. We don't want them within two inches of the edge also. So, <clears throat> As we said, most common cause of uh, problem with a deck failure is the ledger board pulling away from the house. So the 2021 IRC made some changes regarding placement of the uh, of bolts or, or wall anchors, you know, whatever you want to call it, but uh, lags into the wall. So for older ledgers, a rough rule of thumb was on center spacing of ledger fasteners and inches. Um, and basically, let's say we have um, uh, 100 inches uh, divided by, or, or 100 divided by a 12 foot joist length means eight, eight half inch lag screws for that length of 12 foot joist. So in older ones, that's kind of the pattern we see typically staggered. However, they now don't have just a a, like a, a rule, they have this chart to use. So on this chart, and this is right out of the IRC, out of the 2021 IRC. For example, assume a deck is built with 40 PSF live load design. The joists are spanning 10 feet with half inch diameter lag screws are used. The on center spacing of fasteners is 18 inches. The tip of the lag screw, as most of you know, should fully extend through and beyond the inside surface of the band joist. So that one's assuming that the deck is being attached at floor level to the floor band on the house. And we want to see if we can see it at all, like in a basement or crawl space, you can sometimes see this. Obviously a deck that's higher up uh, where the, there's a finished ceiling on the inside of the house, we, you wouldn't see whether the lags come all the way through or the bolts go all the way through at all. But if you can see it, you should see those lags protruding all the way through 
you know, typically says the tip of the screw. So basically we're talking at least see one of the threads on the lag sticking through the floor band rim joist of the house sticking through that. So you'd see it just poking through the um, and 18 inches uh, on center. So a lot more uh, fastening there typically of that. So, and we mentioned this earlier, here's one that's wrong. Got it's less than two inches from the edge here, although it's not way off, it's about an inch and a half, but it's still less than two inches. Like the deck is working. Uh, I treat this more as a comment than indicating we got to do something. If you see evidence of failure coming, that's a little different story, but certainly didn't uh, install this properly. The, uh, they did flash it into the wall, so that was good. And they didn't put it on top of the dry stack stone veneer here, so that was good. So we did a few things, but they should have put that lag down a little ways. Then, so the prescription typically is for half inch lags or bolts with the washer on the surface of the ledgers. Now, but there's other screws or uh, bolts that can be approved that are smaller than this. They typically have that stamping on the inside. This one here, the installation has slightly broken the surface. Uh, you know, a little exuberant in, in screwing this one in, but I'm not going to get critical of that. Uh, if they just drive it in where it's completely flush with the surface here, then that's definitely over screwed into the ledger because we want these to be on the surface of the wood so that they're getting the full thickness of the wood for their support. Here's one. And maybe it's slightly above the surface, but it's definitely overdriven. So it can't be countersunk into the, in this case, ledger board. Here we got, they use bolts. That's cool, but they didn't. The bolts are too short and they didn't weren't aren't able to put the nuts on where they're fully threaded onto the ends of that bolt. So oops, and you can't countersink this to give you that little you know eighth of an inch, uh three sixteenths of an inch of bolt extra we need here. So should have used longer bolts. Is it failing? Are the bolts loose? Are the nuts loose here? No, but it's still something going to make at least a comment about it. You know, in the world of things that are wrong or bad, you know, there's misdemeanors and felonies. This one may be a mis this is a misdemeanor, but something we're definitely going to show that we saw, make a comment about. So back on talking about some of our attachments here and things. So half inch lags or bolts, you know, we like galvanized ones, obviously should have, there's a, a bolt might be used, washers on it. These are the things that we want to see when we're looking at it. You can see the head there, typically, you know, it's going to be close to three quarters of an inch head. Um, the, um, you know, see a little tiny head, it's not right. However, some, uh, you know, companies that make attachments for things have some screws or, yeah, screws that are hardened steel or whatever that, that are, not half inch, but still approved for use on decks. You know, you see that little uh, stamp on the end there that kind of is an indicator that this one is approved for that use. I don't know if you can see it on that uh, screw there, but got this little embossed uh, stamp there on the end telling us that this one would, is this one's strong tie, by the way would be approved for that. Uh, a different one 
and I've seen these a few times, is this one here with the, um, the, uh, the big uh, you know, hexagon head on it for, uh, and has a little flange on it, but there's also the embossing and stamping around it telling us that it's, you know, uh, one of the approved attachments also. So, you know, look, you know, you see a, uh, a drywall screw peeking at you. No, they can use a drywall screw to quick attach. In fact, in this photo here, we can see a couple of galvanized nails right there and there that they use just to tack the ledger board on. Well, that's fine. If you want to use a drywall screw for that, fine. But then they uh, came back as they should have with lags to anchor it to the wall so that it is now you know, well attached. The, there could be some other screws that might be approved for that use that uh, we see, but you know, the drywall screws, whether you know, galvanized ones or just a plain black you know, drywall screw, no. And speaking of the nails, you know, galvanized nail, like I said, fine for, for tacking it up, but not you for use anchoring or securing it to the wall. The, um, so um, we'll get into a little something here. I see a couple of questions, so I'm gonna to try to tack on those. Uh, it says here, the nothing rules do not include manufacturing eye joists, correct? You can notch the eye joist more. Uh, no, I don't think you can, uh, if I'm understanding your question, you cannot, uh, like a TJI or something, you cannot notch those. The, uh, are we supposed to be using our camera to prove we are attending this webinar? I believe the answer is correct for those two. Uh, the answer is yes, you are. Um, so uh, that is, I think that is true. You can check with Kayla later on that, but I think that's true. So um, the, um, um, so cool. Okay, guys. Uh, the uh, on the the um, um, the um, ledger board on this photograph here is on top of the siding. You're not allowed to do that. Also, uh, the uh, it didn't didn't look like they have flashing here on the top of it either. So we want that ledger board also flashed into the siding. So one of the things is ledger boards must be direct attached to the floor band or at least the framing. Now, sometimes depending on how the deck is attached to the house, it may not be directly where the floor band is. <clears throat> and so it needs to be lagged into the uh, studs, but it needs, in any event, needs to be directly attached to the um, framing. Now, you know, you have plywood sheathing or OSB board sheathing on top of the uh, floor band or the studs, and then that ledger board goes on top of that. That is allowed. That is okay. But our, you know, siding, our finished work, whether, you know, and, and, you know, you know that photograph on the right here shows vinyl siding, but that deck is a freestanding deck. It's also only, as you can see with the dirt there, it's only like two and a half feet off the ground, but it's, um, they got, it's freestanding on this column here. Now, obviously using drywall screws to secure it to the column. So oops, we still have a big problem with the way they built this deck, but it's, even though it's up against the house, it's not attached to the house. So this, the problem here can be this stuff over here and is this stuff over here, but it's not that it, it's not attached through that vinyl side. But this one over here, they, this uh, composite siding here, they put, instead of cutting out the siding, 
exposing the floor pan and the framing there, and then putting that ledger board directly against that uh, framing and, or uh, floor band. They put it on top of the siding. Can't do that. It can't be on top of stucco. Uh, it can't be on top of brick veneer. It, uh, you know, fiber cement siding can't be on top of that. Can't be on top of just of uh, you know some kind of wood siding. It has to be directly attached to the uh, framing. Whoops. And I got to say, I see that done wrong constantly. It's just, it's one of those big clues, at least for me around our area, they didn't pull a permit for the job. And as I'm fond of saying, I don't care if they pulled the permit or not, I just want it done right. And so this is not done right. So many times I can see these where they're 10, 15 years old, maybe older, and no evidence that the deck is failing, coming loose, anything. It was still done wrong. I'm still going to make a note that it is attached over the siding and that is, or it's improperly attached over the siding. Obviously, if I see some kind of evidence of a failure, well, now that is going to be a bigger uh, issue and a more extensive write up in the report. Also, attachments to cantilever floors generally not allowed and because the cantilever was never this is like fireplace cantilever here the fireplace or the cantilever was never designed to or generally uh, was not designed to support adding this weight of the deck bearing out of, out here so how do you do a, uh, a deck that is butting up against a cantilever of some kind. Well, one of the ways is like this. On, our, on the sides of our, uh, in this case, like a bay window or chimney thing here, you have double up the uh, uh, joist over here, put a header across the face of our cantilever. And there, that way, it's not attached to the cantilever. It's not putting any stress on the cantilever. And it says six foot maximum there. Uh, and that will take that, or there's no load at all on the cantilever. And that is the way to do that properly without adding any possible load on our framing on the cantilever. So again, here, oops, wrong again. Can't do this. You know, they put their ledger board directly on to the cantilever, oops. Uh, got a problem here. Or they could add a column right here to support the ledger board. So, and put those columns spacing them properly for the ledger board. So the, the ledger board is, uh, it's not, so it's not basically a freestanding deck, maybe, you know, loosely bolted to the house just so it's not you know, free swinging out here, but it's not depending on the house to support this end of the deck because they've added columns along here to underneath the ledger to give it that bearing or load to support the, uh, or, or bearing to support the load of the ledger there. So that is a way to fix it. Obviously, we uh, tread lightly as home inspectors when we are, you know, well, we don't try not to, to prescribe, you know, repairs. So basically, if you're, the point of all this is, if you're looking at a deck, it's up against a cantilever, and you see those columns, supporting the ledger against the house, you're good. It's uh, not a problem, they did it right, we're happy. So again, uh, ledger boards now are required to be pressure treated so that uh, if, you know, water, anything gets 
uh, behind it or uh, it starts rotting, it doesn't necessarily mean the whole deck has to be ripped off to replace it. Here we may have some issues with the spacing of the attachment and type of bolts, but the big problem, of course, still is they to put it over the siding and they did not flash it into the siding. Over here, we can see uh, again, they, they put the ledger board as pressure treated lumber. So ooh, good for that. Uh, the bracket there, and it looks like some uh, drywall screws, uh, maybe in it too. Uh, the bracket here doesn't look like it may be truly approved for the joist here, but no flashing on, to keep water from going down behind the ledger. So, okay, good. Pressure treated ledger. It's not going to rot or easily rot, but what about the framing on the house when it gets behind here? It might still cause rot on the house, and then we still have a huge problem. So attaching the ledger board to directly onto a foundation, which is often done, uh, you, using approved anchors, you know, whether you drill them out or maybe they were planning for the deck when they poured the foundation and they put some uh, J anchors and J, yeah, J anchors in there or something, who knows. But in any event, proved anchors, ledger board attachment, uh, pressure treated lumber. So caulk that top edge just to, you know, kind of reduce the opportunity for water to get in behind the ledger. This is again sort of that best practice, best way to do it, best practice for it. Uh, for our purposes, you know, is it looking solid? Do we see you know, our washers and our bolts uh, or nuts are uh, on the surface of the wood, tightened down. We may, may not be able to see that caulking there. If there's clear evidence they didn't caulk it, certainly, you know, recommend a caulking. But the big thing is that they use pressure treated lumber here, but obviously we don't flash this. So <clears throat> here we got. Um, and well, I discussed this earlier that the ledger, you know, here, so here's our floor band right here. So the ledger board right here, not on top of the siding, we're good. They could have the uh, plywood or OSB board or something right here, ledger on top of it, and then all bolted through where we can see the inside of our bolt coming completely through the floor band here, peeking through to show us that they put this together. Um, the, uh, so as a, interestingly, they do allow for up to one inch of open space between the house band and the ledger, but that doesn't, it's open space. That doesn't mean you can have the, um, siding underneath that. It's just a gap there for water to drain through, air to get in and dry things out. I gotta say, I have not seen a deck done that way, but you can stack uh, washers up, for instance, to give you um, a, a gap there if, uh, if you need to. Also, one of the neat changes is this tension uh, device that secures the deck to the house. This is typically on the either end of the deck. And so rather than just relying on our legs here to hold the deck on, but and then relying on the uh, joist hangers here to hold the joist to the ledger board, just a little added insurance to make sure that it's very difficult for the deck to pull away from the house is adding these tensioners, tension devices <clears throat> onto the, um, like I said, it's usually the last, uh, you know, rim joist, maybe the next joist in on the, ed on the ends of the deck. And that long all thread bolt there goes all the way through the ledger, through the, uh, 
you know, the uh, OSB or the uh, half inch sheathing on the uh, framing and here and through uh, the floor band and then attaches to a similar tension device on the inside of the house. So here's one in real life, so to speak, showing you how it looks on the deck side, anchoring, pulling on the deck to make sure, or to at least, you know, reduce the opportunity for the deck to pull away from the house. So this is another one of these new things. There's, you know, some variations on this theme, but something like this device on new decks should be there when you're looking at uh, a deck that's been built in the last two years. If you're in an area that has adopted the 2021 IRC, uh, you know, some of the areas where I live don't always adopt the most recent code book. So they aren't necessarily following prescriptions like this because they are not on the new code book. But if you're in an area where they are, this is the kind of thing you're going to be looking for on new deck construction. There's our flashing. Very good. Oh, look, it's not sitting on top of the siding. So they got it uh, attached to the framing like they should or the floor band. Got a nice half inch bolt there with a washer on it. All looking pretty good here. So uh, it says here, they should be, these tension devices should be installed within 24 inches of each end of the deck. So that's what I mean. Sometimes I've seen them on this next joist over, uh, still within that 25th, 24 inch from the end, but um, somewhere in that near the edges of the deck, we should be seeing these things. This is a different version of one with this uh, approved, one of the approved, you know, attachments, uh, you know, going through, anchoring it to the wall. You know, if you can see the end of this little lag screw, this little lag screw peeking through on the other side, uh, then it should be peeking through on the other side. But these are approved for deck attachment and they used it here to attach you know, it's a version of a tension device or an anchor to the joist here. Got a nice split there in the joist, which we'll be talking about later, but those are, that split is not necessarily a bad thing, but definitely something that uh, we look for just to make sure it's uh, uh, not causing a bigger issue. Uh, you know, in this case, as it says down here, city inspector approved this attachment and um, apparently wasn't bothered by the crack either. The, um, <clears throat> so here we go with block construction, uh, you know, showing how it at least should be done with the anchors being anchored into a, an epoxy acrylic uh, uh, you know, glue essentially on the inside of the block to get it uh, a wider, bearing, shall we say, on the back side of the block here to for the bolt and then everything else pretty much the same as we saw with a concrete uh, uh, foundation wall. The uh, So also about attaching joists to uh, ledgers. So you can use a little, um, I just had a mental blank here, but a little trim board, trim, it's not trim, but a bearing board down here for these to, for the lock joist to rest on to get some support here. And these have to be obviously anchored to the ledger very well, uh, screwed, anchored through. I gotta say, this is a type of attachment I never see, but it is approved. The um, um, here depicting that, so they went through on the other side here and they just used screws 
going straight into our ledger from the other side of our rim joist over here. So they got screws just coming in here, like six or four different, whoops, back up, back up, back up. Four screws coming through here. Well, you can't do that. You must have that joist hanger, some sort of approved joist hanger here to support this and not be relying on screws or lags going through here that uh, you know, either might not have the shear strength for it or could uh, just not bearing the, not into the, this joist here, anchored well into it. They may not go into it very deep. All kinds of things that we just can't know. We want to see the joist hanger here. Joist hangers, there they are. That's what we want to see. Yeah, they didn't stagger their bolts there on the ledger. Oops. But uh, we got joist hangers here, which, by the way, every hole that's supposed to have a screw or crude nail, 16 penny galvanized nail, in has. A screw in it or a, a nail in it. You know, they, you know, yeah, if you want to add one, people do for some reason up here. Okay, that's an extra, but it does not substitute for the nails or screws going into the holes on the joist hanger or any metal bracket that are supposed to have screws or uh, fasteners in them. Here we go. Also, that lag there looks like a great idea, right? But oops, it does not replace properly using you know approved nails uh, in the holes that are supposed to have nails in them for the joist hanger. And uh, we got a nail pop there already. <clears throat> so we've got a few things going on here. Oh, and then it's also joist is floating, so to speak, above the bottom of the joist hanger, should be seated right in the bottom of the joist hanger. So a couple of things here that we did it over here on the next side too, the, the, the lag right there too. This is not a substitution either for a lag out here in the ledger board with a washer under it. So yeah, it looks clever. It's probably working great. Still not done the way it should be, amateurish work. And yeah, you know, that's just unclear on the concept. The uh, nail, doesn't matter that that nail's popping out. It's not in the joist anyway, in this one either. You know, so got a nail pop there, but these aren't, these nail pops aren't a problem. That's our problem. That are joist simply it's barely sitting in the joist hanger and nothing securing this to the wall or to the uh, ledger here and then the wall either so oops got a problem with that uh, construction there and then this is also popular um so we got a joist coming in here at an angle and so it's Instead of getting a joist hanger that was made for an angle, they just took a regular one, bent the tab here on it, and then put in the nails, and kind of tore out the hole there on that one, or some stresses ripped it out or something there. But you cannot form or reform. This is manufacturer's instructions on these things. Manufacturer for these things does not warrant them, so to speak, <clears throat> for modifications. So you can't bend this to the desired shape, hammer it out, whatever you're doing, doesn't matter. You can't bend this joist hanger here, can't fold this one in, fold this one out to make it fit without voiding the warranty for this hanger and then you know, issues with nail pops and other things going on. So just poor workmanship there. So here again, some nail pops uh, on coming out. The, uh, you know, it, it, 
interesting thing is, you know, okay, why don't uh, we just pull these nails out, put a screw in the hole? Well, because of the diameter of the nails versus screws and stuff you put in, that's not an approved fix. Screws have to go into new hole, uh, new wood, new holes, however you want to phrase it there. Uh, so you can't, and this is on the, the manufacturer of the screws or lags uh, instructions, you can't pull that nail and just stick a screw in there and be good. Here are you know, proved screws. Oh, that's good, except look, barely caught, not even an eighth inch of the joist here and got a gap here with it pulling out or, or poorly put on there. And look, here's his issue. He's, he didn't cut, he got the top of the uh, house or, or siding or whatever. So this kind of poorly conceived here on getting the uh, joist up tight against the ledger board and bad attachment here. So it's, it's not our problem how to fix this or how to prescribe the fix. We just call it out, oops, bad. So again, metal hanger, can't be you know reshaped to uh, fit whatever the use is. You can never put screws into the end grains. We talked about that earlier because um, they just don't grip well. Uh, so it's not a approved way to do it, so to speak. Um, so all this amateur screw came right out through the side of uh, the stair stringer here. Uh, again, in the end grain here, and you know, not to mention it's on top of the siding. So it's a couple of issues there, no flashing, multiple things going on there that are wrong. They, so they bent a, a, a joist hanger down or folded the wing out, so to speak. Uh, and they used screws that may not be even approved for this use. And then uh, they put them in the end grain, so many things wrong. Just so many things wrong. So, yep, these metal brackets, they just have places, kind of hurricane sort of clips, but they're not approved to hold joist hangers and uh, old drywall screws in there too. So, yeah, again, a couple of things wrong. Ain't the way to do it. It's wrong. So, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, our illustration here with the ledger board on top of the brick a veneer no if this is structural brick bearing weight bearing brick on the on a house for instance then the other rules for attaching ledger boards to masonry kick in and that can be done but if it's brick veneer nope can't do it here we have this uh fake faux stone veneer here and nope, can't do that. You just, you know, it, it's obviously a lot of work <clears throat> to remove stone here and make, uh, so you can, the ledger board can be directly attached to the framing or the floor band. Got to do it. Not our, it's, it's wrong, we write it up. The, uh, you know, it's a big job, but it's wrong. So here we're showing, uh, kind of best practice stuff here, so to speak. So you can see that red board here is the sheathing on the wall framing. Uh, we got uh, you know, whatever our uh, exterior cladding or whatever it is. Uh, we got, uh, so they put the uh, uh, flashing directly against our either our, our framing or our sheathing, wall sheathing here. We have the water resistant barrier or house wrap going down over the top of the flashing. This one shows Z flashing here. Gotta say, I've never seen Z flashing used for this. It's always L flashing. Um, so, you know, 
but this illustration shows Z flashing here. I don't know. I don't know any reason why you couldn't use that. I've just you know, never seen that done. Uh, so, and then they put flashing also on the bottom. I've never seen that done either, but that is certainly a best practice. But unless you're in an area that requires that flashing on the bottom of the ledger, that is not something that we're going to call out as wrong if it's not there. It just, but we absolutely want our upper siding, stucco, whatever it may be up here, flashed over the ledger board or to the ledger board. But this flashing on the bottom, at least uh, typically not required, but definitely could um, arguably a, a best practice. So here, this is very typical of what I see. So ledger board, it's uh, you see by the one inch of uh, ledger sticking out here that it's been attached directly to the framing. We've got our siding butted up to it. They caught that. Nice. That's cool. We have the L flashing up here. So pretty good uh, installation here. Got the lags on the uh, surface of the, of the uh, ledger with washers on them. Looking good. Looking good there. <sighs> Looks clever. Roofing felt used for the flashing here instead of the metal flashing. No. But turns out here's the backstory on this one. And sometimes, you know, getting the backstory, you go, okay, I see why they did it, but still wrong. Um, these people had a male dog that like the pee on the house wall up here and the acidity of that dog's urine over the years completely rotted the flashing away. And their old ledger board started rotting. So they had the deck rebuilt or they did it themselves. And so thinking they were clever, instead of coming back with metal flashing, I mean, I guess arguably using house wrap or felt or something over completely over the top of the metal flashing to protect it from the dog's urine. They just used roofing felt, thinking that that would be uh, resistant to the uh, dog's urine and did that there. So that was the backstory. Kind of interesting to know, but for our purposes, ah, no, roofing felt not approved for uh, substituting for the metal flashing here, even though we know, understand the reason why they were thinking that was a good idea, but is not approved for that. So let us, well, before we do this, let's uh, see here. Many of the photos you show have undersized joist hangers. Is that a concern? It can be. But keep in mind, uh, you know, joist hangers, uh, like uh, for a two by six, that hanger is also rated for two by eights. So you put it on a two by eight and you have a big gap of wood sticking up there above it. So uh, knowing, you know, I don't have a tape on those photos showing exactly what the size of the joist is compared to the hanger. But yes, you could. Yeah, definitely. I've seen two by four joist hangers used on two by twelves. Well, no, you can't do that at all. So it can be a concern uh, if it's uh, they definitely did not uh, uh, match the uh, the hanger with the correct joist. In Clarkstown, New York, they are requiring a joist hanger for ledger attachment. They no longer allow a joist sitting on a board. Well, there you go. So. Knowing what your local uh, authorities, building inspectors want to see is uh, huge, it's huge, and it can vary from areas. You know, here I'm in the Denver metro, uh, Denver, Colorado area, and uh, you know, uh, one of our our biggest suburb, Aurora, Aurora just lives in its own world. They just kind of make things up. 
So it, well, not kind of, they do make things up. And the um, one, one of their head inspectors told me a few years back, we like to use common sense here in Aurora when we apply the code. Well, you know, great. But uh, I said to him, you know, common sense is a little subjective. And he says, yeah, but I'm the one making the decision. Well, you got it, you know, guys and, you know, city inspectors in your area doing the same thing. It sure helps to know what they're doing. So you're not just banging your head against the wall when you're writing up things that are clearly in, you know, look, we say this constantly. It's like, you know, boilerplate to say it, but uh, you all know we're not code inspectors, but obviously so much of what we do overlaps with code. So we're certainly aware of a lot of code things, but uh, you see something that is allowed by code, but you know your local guy wants to, or gal wants to see something different. Yeah, I'm gonna follow what my local inspectors are saying. I may, uh, I may put in uh, my re report uh, something like, um, uh, this is not compliant with current standards, but often allowed in this jurisdiction or something like that. Uh, you know, and but I've walked in on things where it, it's not code compliant at all, and the signed permit is sitting right there. Well, you know, the code, I mean, are the building inspectors, they're, they're kind of like preachers. They interpret the Bible for their congregation, and that's the way it is. And we have to live with that. So uh, my two cents on it, uh, you know, and if you disagree with me, I'm not offended. Uh, that's what makes the world go round. But that's the way I treat it and the way I do those things. So let's see here if we can get this link working here. Maybe. Um, the, uh, and we'll watch. Hi, yes. I'm Ben from InterNACHI, and I'm standing in front of the InterNACHI House of Horrors in Colorado. It's an entire house with a thousand defects built under our roof. In this video, we're going to learn a little bit about deck ledger flashing, and we're also going to refer to the International Residential Code. So get out your textbook and let's take a look at this demonstration of deck ledger flashing. Okay, so the International Residential Code of this code book, um, section R703.4, flashing. It says approved corrosion resistant flashing shall be applied in a shingle fashion in a manner to prevent entry of water into the wall cavity or penetration of water into the building structural framing components and self-adhered membranes could be um, considered flashing according to some standards. So um, that's again, R703.4. So let's go over some of the components of this uh, little demo here, of uh, the deck ledger flashing, and then we'll talk about the flashing itself. Um, so this is the poor concrete foundation on some grass next to it. And um, there's a sill gasket, a sill plate on top of the foundation wall, um, band joist, floor sheathing, stud, stud wall, exterior sheathing. And this is the house wrap. And this is also considered the drainage plane and the water resistive barrier. This is um, flashing here. So this would be installed next. Um, this would be uh, uh, below the ledger board and the membrane would be installed this way on top of the top edge of the flashing and then the ledger board would be installed. So the top edge of this metal flashing down here would be protected by a shingle manner like installation of the um, membrane waterproofing. And then the ledger board is attached. It's got to be at least a two by eight. And then flashing on the top. And then to cover that top edge of the metal flashing, we have um, the membrane once again. It's adhesive, right? Now, to stop, um, to continue that shingle uh, flashing manner, um, what we did was we cut the house wrap and feathered in this top 
membrane, which is covering the top of the metal flashing. And it's adhered underneath the house wrap. And then this incision, this cut is taped over. So this is flashing, metal flashing, metal flashing. You've got your floor joists attached with floor um, uh, joist hangers to the ledger board. So in the code book, it says, apply it in a shingle-like fashion, right? A manner to prevent entry of water into the wall panel. Well, I think of shingle-like as to be like this, where we're referring to asphalt shingles of a roof and um, the bottom layer is there. And then this is shingled on top of that and shingled on top of that. So everything is diverted away. It's shingled, it's overlapped in the correct manner. Um, there isn't any open edge, right? To allow water to come in. Everything, if you can imagine water coming down in a shingle-like fashion, everything's installed in a manner to divert the water away from the, the structure itself. So when you're looking at the installation of deck ledger flashing, um, the important part is it's installed in shingle-like fashion. So let's look at this a little bit up close. Um, again, the metal flashing overlapped with the membrane. Um, the deck ledger is attached. And then at the top, let's remove the, the floorboard of the deck. We have metal flashing here. The top edge of the metal flashing is overlapped by the another sheet of membrane. And then that incision where it's feathered in and taped over. Now, the actual installation of all the shingling and materials isn't detailed in code at all. It's really um, construction standard best, best practices, um, things like that. The code just says applied shingle fashion in a manner to divert water away. So there are a few resources where you may say see some um, differences in between this area here in particular above the, um, the top flashing. But the idea is to shed water away. Another detail is how does this flashing, um, how do we get this installed properly? And there are many uh, recommendations. Code is silent. Um, some resources say that the contractor should make some incisions on either on both sides of the floor choice and bend this down. Some say that this flashing actually should be installed behind guys uh <laughs> interesting little thing ups guy got stuck in a snow drift on my driveway uh i'm gonna run this video is i got uh, about five more minutes in it we're at the middle of the uh uh session anyway so let's take 10 minutes after this ends and i'll see if i can get the ups guy unstuck from my driveway in that 10 minutes and be back to you guys. Uh, let's see here. Let's say circa 540, uh, I mean, or uh, uh, be uh, 740 on Eastern time, uh, something like that. So <laughs> interesting. We have a blizzard going on here in the Colorado area right now. So uh, I'll uh, be back uh, shortly here and I'll let this video finish. This is a really good video by Ben here showing absolute best practice stuff. So cool, uh, I'll be right back uh, in about 15 minutes. The um, ledger board, that doesn't make any sense. Another one says it should be lift over um, and that would mean bending the flashing on site. Um, I think cutting the flashing and bending the flashing is too much. Um, it introduces too many, um, too much room for human error with the contractors. This is actually very easy to install. And you would actually pull the floorboard away just a little bit to give it a little room to drain. Code mentions water resistive barrier, and it says um, the water resistive barrier in section R703.2. It's one layer of number 15 asphalt felt complying with a certain standard or other approved water resistant barriers, um, and that's the waterproofing membrane. So this material is compliant with code um, and best practices as well. There are a bunch of defects that you probably see. Um, the fasteners aren't installed properly and um, the actual joist hangers were cut 
they were actually for two by tens, and this is a two by eight installation. Now, one of the things uh, while we're here is clearance to grade. Um, if siding was here, let's just assume siding was here, it would be installed below the bottom flashing. And you can think of two, six, and eight. What you want is um, eight inches from this piece of wood, any wood seal component on top of the foundation. Um, needs to be at least eight inches away from ground, unless it's preserved with you. But in general, I think of it as a home inspector, eight inches. If there was siding here, the bottom of this siding um, should be at least six inches from grade. And if the ground was a walking surface, like a sidewalk, a hard surface, um, you need at least two inches of clearance. Uh, IRC code book says, Seven, uh, sorry, section R317.3.1 um, talks about the fasteners. And then um, we talk about also half inch diameter bolts if the fasteners of a ledger board is for bolts. But um, the fasteners here um, includes nuts and washers for preserved treated wood shall be of hot dipped G185 zinc coated galvanized steel, stainless steel, silicone bonds, or copper fasteners. Here we have fasteners attaching the ledger board to the structure. Um, here, there's one there, there's one hidden over there. And they're actually, I, we picked these up at Home Depot, uh, ledger lock. And ledger lock actually says, the coating on this fastener has been tested in wood treatment chemicals such as ACQ and found to provide equivalent protection to code approved hot dipped galvanized. So they're saying it's equivalent to the code requirements. And obviously there's a defect here. This isn't sunk in all the way. And this is sunk in too much. And that one is actually um, behind the joist, which isn't a problem, except for the joist now is um, not fully inserted into the joist hanger. The ledger board um, has to have a clearance of two inches. So you can't have a fastener within the top two inches of the ledger board and the bottom three quarters of the ledger board. If it's too close to the edge, the idea is that the board will crack. So the top needs more meat of the wood. So there's a two inch um, clearance. You can have a ledger fastener within that top two inches and the bottom three quarters. This one here is getting a little close. Um, so it's one of the things you can keep a look at. Oh, and also two inches from the end. So if this was an end, of a ledger board. Uh, you don't want a fastener at the very end because it would crack it. And code mentions um, the seal gasket. Um, and it's in section or table N1102.4.1.1. And it's really for air leakage. Um, there are termite plates and things like that, but air leakage is uh, recommended um, to stop air leakage. There's also recommendations from other sources about putting um, spray foam sealant or glue here, 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 and there, um, just to stop air leakage. Now let's take a look around the other side here, and we can take a look at um, bolts that attach the ledger plate, uh, sorry, that attach the seal plate to the poured concrete foundation. Um, half inch bolts need to be um, embedded into the poured concrete foundation in each seven inches. It's impossible for a home inspector to see that. Um, you can look for defects like a loose washer here. Um, you can look for spacing as well of the uh, fasteners. And you want the fasteners within the middle third, ideally. You don't want, again, a fastener on the very edge. You can also take a look at the um, ledger board fasteners as they come through the band joist. They're required, the tips are required to go through the band joist. And I see one here, so that's good. Um, there's a crack in the floor joist here. Looks like a nail is missed there. So that's a quick training video on the deck ledger flashing. Um, remember a shingle-like manner. And um, this demonstration is always here at the NNG House of Horrors in Boulder, Colorado. Feel free to come on by and take a look for more defects. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye. So, sorry guys, uh, I was 
have a little bit of a, I cleared the snow drifts out a few hours ago on my driveway. I have a 200 foot driveway and uh, wind's blowing pretty hard here and redrifted it and the UPS guy got stuck in it. But uh, we're good now. Um, so let's see here. Um, <laughs> Okay, good. We're good. Good. Okay, so you guys can see me and stuff. So we are rocking and rolling here. Good deal. Okay, so um, interesting. A couple of things here about cantilever decks. Uh, first of all, I've seen that video with Ben before. What he's describing there in that video is like fantastic best case construction. Uh, I got to tell you, I've never seen it done that well before. Uh, but you know, when you're trying to describe what things that it should be, because sometimes, you know, so often we have clients going, well, you know, what do you mean it's wrong or something? And you're trying to describe it. Well, that shingled uh, layered thing that Ben was showing there really is a good descriptor for what we're trying to tell people what, what it matters, having the uh, the house wrap, water resistant barrier going down over the flashing, the flashing going down over the ledger board, water diverting the water, uh, over the ledger board, and uh, getting uh, so it, water does not get behind the ledger board and, you know, water in the wrong place, <laughs> mischief. So that is the um, uh, a, a nice illustration or nice video to kind of explain just a knockout way to uh, make that uh, really water proof almost for keeping water out from behind uh, the ledger board and there's other places but you know you're talking ledger board not only for deck but also for a, a porch overhang or the deck cover or something like that that uh, where you have a ledger attached to a wall, same thing, same principles applying there and stuff on that. So now to this slide with cantilever decks. <clears throat> it, you know, sometimes for various reasons, people want to stick that deck out past the uh, last beam and, and column there. And so there are prescriptions for uh, uh, doing that. The uh, so basically, uh, joists should be cantilevered no more than one quarter of the joist length and three times the joist width or the nominal depth there. Both conditions must be true. So what if a two by 12 joist then can be cantilevered out 36 inches? Uh, the, uh, you know, it, there used to be this, uh, you know, length uh, divided by four times uh, length of the um, joist divided by four is the cantilever, but that's no longer the rule on that. So in our example over here with the uh, 10 foot uh, uh, joist, we would have a 30 inch cantilever on that two by 10 um, example or two by 10 joist there. So, um, <sighs> You know, another descriptor of this with our six by six post and our girder or beam across there. And then that, uh, this one's showing, this is an old illustration showing the L4 descriptor there and stuff, but kind of just the point of this kind of giving you the top view of what we're talking about. So under the 2021 IRC, we once again have a, uh, uh, a prescription, a, a chart showing exactly what they want, even giving us uh, different woods and stuff here, which is pretty uh, amazing. But uh, so for our examples here that we have circled, we'll call it conservative, round down from 13 foot seven inches to 12 feet at the joist back span, the maximum cantilever is three feet. Um, Oddly enough, the old L4 rule kicks in or would apply in this application. So, you know, basically, you know, what are you looking at? If it just looks too long, now you start doing some math on it. Oh, that one looks too long, doesn't it? I don't even have to do the math on that one. Nope, wrong. 
way, way too far. Like, uh, what is that, four and a half feet. So that one, easy. Just, hey, you walk up there, get a nice eye beam, you know, that's pretty cool. But uh, otherwise, a no, hard no on that. Too far. The um, here, decks greater than six feet above grade, should have diagonal bracing from post to girder and stuff. Uh, you know, if you walk out on the deck and it's shaking like some jelly, like a little bit of jelly, you, you don't probably don't even have to look uh, without saying we need additional bracing. But this is an example of the type of bracing that we're looking for to keep decks from being wobbly and to make sure they're stable. The, uh, and then a cross brace, angle brace across here, diagonal brace across here, also keeps that shimmy, that kind of twisting action from uh, uh, happening. So we, um, again, it's more important on decks that are higher off the ground where uh, shaking could loosen things and then things start coming apart. So having that bracing on the taller decks is where we're really looking for it. Obviously, you walk out on a deck that's three feet off the ground and feels like you're standing on a bowl of jelly. I'm still gonna say, you know, um, we need uh, bracing done here. Let's uh, get a contractor out to figure out the best way to brace it. Uh, you know, there's a little, one of the little, you know, tricks is to tap on uh, something like these lags with a hammer. If you get that hollow clicking sound, it's not tight. I've never done that. Uh, I certainly agree it's something you can do. When I work construction, I would do that sometimes. But as a home inspector, I uh, don't have the uh, hammer in my pocket, so to speak, or on my belt uh, at all. So, I, you know, if they look loose, uh, or you can just grab them and turn them, then well, now we got a problem. And then in our example over here on the uh, right, a couple of things. Those screws there are construction screws, but you'd have to really check the labeling on the, on the box of screws to really know or, or be sure that they're labeled for this sort of uh, construction. Uh, the, uh, I think I have one. Yeah, here, here's one right here, you know. It's a construction screw, but is it labeled for that? Maybe, maybe not. But our big issue here is this, countersunk the lags into the ledger without, so it's countersunk and they didn't put a washer on it. So two things wrong. So there's our big call out. And then we make a comment in our report that, screws attaching the uh, joist hanger, hangers uh, could be, uh, may not be approved for that use. So, you know, wood ages, it often cracks. Uh, some crack, not all cracks are equal. So this is really gets into some judgment call stuff for us as home inspectors. Um, you know, because you don't want to get into that calling out every crack in a board because, wow, uh, you, you're going to see them all the time. So do you think that crack is materially affecting the um, integrity of that board? This crack on our left, not seeing it. we got other issues to talk about here, but not the crack. On this stringer, on this uh, staircase here, wow, that is really broken up. I'm thinking maybe we got a problem. And by the way, this is a pressure treated board too. This is that old uh, uh, arsenic treatment that isn't done much anymore. So it was green board. And it's kind of my observation. I don't know if you guys see the same thing or think the same thing, but that particular uh, pressure treated type of lumber did, does not hold up well when it's exposed to direct sunlight. It, um, maybe that's a Colorado thing at our altitude, but I see that older uh, preserved wood or uh, pressure treated lumber with that that's green 
man, it just is deteriorating badly when it's exposed to sunlight. If it's protected from the sunlight, that is great. And this one was directly in the sunlight for darn sure. So that is the extreme going the other way on from here, no big deal to woo, we got an issue here. This crack here, look, it doesn't materially affect the integrity of the board of the overall joist here, even though it is a you know, gapping longitudinal crack. So this one, I'm not gonna call out either. This end crack here, again, you can see it just, it's on the end. I'm just not gonna call this one out either. The, uh, these aren't, if I see a board coming apart, see the crack, sometimes you'll see the grain kind of running to the edges of the board and that crack will follow that grain right through the edge of the, of the joist and that piece will be just breaking out. Well, now that's a different thing. That's, got, that's weakening the board. I'm gonna call that one out. Um, so, let's see a couple more questions here. Let me go up here. D -d 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 -d. Oh, <laughs> funny guy here. I grew up in Buffalo, New York area. You don't have snow. Touche, uh, Mr. Hughes. You are, uh, yeah, you, you definitely do better on, or worse on snow than we do. The last countersunk bolt there looked like a massive check in the ledger that also went into a knot that was also checked. I would suspect the ledger board is compromised. Okay, now you got me one. Let me, let me go back to that because I wasn't looking at that specifically. So, is it that one? Maybe you're talking about this one, the crack going into that knot there. Uh, you know, if it's on the ledger, keep in mind, this thing is attached in multiple points along it. So this board is not free hanging out there in the air where we have uh, various points of tension and compression on this board. It just simply doesn't have that. It's just the anchor for our joist coming off. So if this is the one you're talking about, I don't see the problem here because this ledger isn't hanging out in the air where we're gonna be um, having uh, you know, pressures on one end uh, or out even out in the middle of it because of the way it's anchored uh, every you know, couple of feet or so along the length of the ledger. So that's kind of, if, if that's the one you're talking about, that's the, the way I see that one, just my two cents on it. So, um, guardrails. So this one shows a guardrail supported solely by balusters. Uh, that was done a lot and may, uh, you know, often even allowed, but the new rules are a uh, post every, every six feet. I think I'll have a slide coming up here on that. But anyway, yeah, there it is. Guardrails should be supported by posts every six feet. There, there it is right there. Height, 36 inches at least. Um, you know, you walk up to it, it should be solid. And by the way, as you see at the top, if for some sort of commercial application that you're looking at, then that uh, goes up to 42 inches high. And we'll get into balusters should be no more than four inches apart and some other things there. But talking about those guards, so this is new for the 2021 20, uh, IRC. Where, so for new uh, decks that you're looking at, where guards are connected to the interior or exterior side of a deck joist or beam, the joist or beam shall be connected to the adjacent joist to prevent rotation of the joist or beam. Well, here in our example, the sandwich, that four by four uh, uh, cut post for the guardrail between two of the joists and bolted it through, it's locked in. And uh, can't see it in that photograph. Uh, you know, in boy, if they came through and, and ran some lags or bolts through this way, wow, they would really have it locked in. But this definitely, I mean, they got two of them, so you're still not going to get that shifting, um, you know, toward or away from the deck with it locked in like this. So this is a 
pretty good, except they should have run that bottom of the post all the way flush with the bottom of these joists. And then that would have put a big, they could have put this, you know, one, or, you know that one, oh, it's within two inches of the top of the joist. So they could have pulled it down two inches and put this one down here, uh, you know, down further, you know, two inches, still less than two inches or more than two inches from the edge. But it would have been down more on the uh, center of our uh, post here and might have anchored it in better. But this one, it's rock solid when you're on top of it. Don't have a complaint here. So um, could have been done a little better in our, my subjective opinion. But uh, by the way, if I remember right, this was a permitted deck. So the city guy didn't see a problem with it either. He probably did the same thing I did, grabbed the hand the guardrail and it doesn't move and you're going, we're good. Anyway, major change is requirement that the guard loads shall be transferred to the deck framing. So we don't want this attached to the, uh, just to the rim uh, joist here, which can, with the leverage that you have on that 36 inch high uh, guardrail, you can really put some pressure on this ledger board if that's all it's attached to. But when it's attached to the joist here, it's just gonna be locked in much uh, tighter. So as it says here, this addresses the age old problem that can arise from connecting the guards only to the rim band or the rim joist. Um, the uh, another way to do this is with these brackets that are made for this. Um, the uh, uh, now this is on the rim joist here, but because the bracket is a reinforced bracket that attaches also to the joist over here, uh, it is locking across, and so you're getting that support of the joist on the side too that is locking this in. So even though it looks like it's only on the rim joist, it is um, also um, because of the bracket there supported by the uh, uh, perpendicular joist coming into it. So this one of these things just to kind of keep in mind the power of leverage. Because of leverage, a 200 pound force pushing on a DEX guardrail, 36 inches high, outward, would be inward, but outward, causes a 1700 pound force at the pivot point at the bottom of that column, of that guardrail. So the, um, uh, actually the guardrail maybe, I mean, this column here is gonna be longer than 36 inches. So you get that pivot point down here and you're getting to that seven, somewhere in that vicinity of 1700 pounds of, of uh, force down here. So through that power of leverage, this post here are these balusters, whatever it is, even on an older deck where it may only be balusters here, you need these well supported because of the leverage that can be applied to this bottom connection point down here. So, and also it's note, note the wording here, uh, it says pushing the deck's guardrail outward. So in the old codes, it was back and forth, uh, you know, pulling it in. Well, the common sense thing is if the guardrail breaks as you're pulling inward, where are you gonna go? You're just gonna sit down on the deck and maybe you have a bruise, but that's all. Obviously, if you're pushing outward, and that guardrail fails, now you're gonna to topple over the outside of the deck 10 feet off the ground. That may be more than a bump on your head. So now the new guidelines for checking the integrity of the guardrail is to push outward on it. And look, we're not using some sophisticated measuring devices to see if we're truly pushing 200 pounds of force. You know you give it a, what you consider a good push, the kind of push that, you know, you think it, uh, you know, you would expect your own deck guardrail to support. And if, in my, the way I do this, if I don't like the feel of it, I'm wrapping it up, just simple as that. And yep, it's somewhat subjective, in fact, maybe a lot subjective, 
but that's the way I'm doing it. In my 23 years of doing this, I haven't gotten in trouble for doing that. So that's the way I treat it or whatever that may be worth to you. One little thing uh, kind of is uh, the way the balusters are cut. They should have this angle uh, if you have an open end grain on a post too. Should have a 45 degree angle on it so water drains off and water doesn't sit on that flat surface there and, pop and work its way into that end grain and maybe promote rot, rot there. So if, um, if these aren't capped in some way, then we would look for that uh, angle there to uh, reduce the opportunity for rain to soak into the end grain there and cause, uh, and cause mischief. So this is one of these things that kind of takes a little bit of explanation. But uh, so let's say we have a deck that's uh, you know sitting above grade, uh, but we have a slope on our yard going away from the deck. So if the Bottom edge, this line here should really, well, this line here, let's look at this line here. This line here, deck surface, if 36 inches out, level out in our height here is more than 30 inches, then we must have a guardrail here. If this is 29 inches, guardrail not required. So sometimes, and this is true for porches, um, and I've, I run into this occasionally on porches where you know, one end of the porch is on the driveway or right off the driveway, it's 12 inches above the driveway. I get to the other end of the porch and the grade is sloping away and I'm 36 inches above the grade uh, on the uh, 36 inches away from the porch, edge of the porch, I'm 30, inches or more above the grade and that end of the porch is supposed to have a guardrail and ditto for decks. So this is something, you know, when you're looking at yards that have some slope grade, uh, you know, sloping grades on them and stuff. This occasionally is one of those things where ding, 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 you go, oh, I don't have a guardrail here, but I sure got some fall off here in the, in the yard. And I have to get my tape out, you know, and and uh, I rarely use a level on it because I think I'm good enough that I can kind of ice, you know, cite what level is here. You know, come out 36 inches, drop down and see if I have 30 or more inches of uh, drop over here. And, uh, you know, once in a while, uh, but about five months ago, I had a deck uh, with this issue right here that should have put a guardrail on it. So this is just one of those little things that we uh, try to look for. Uh, as we're doing our deck inspections. <clears throat> so I already mentioned this earlier, uh, but four by four guard posts can no longer be notched at any connection point. However, one of these things that again gets us into the subjective area is if that four by four has been turned, uh, you know, it's got some, you know, uh, it got some scalp or fluting on it or something. Um, and, um, and some of that, you know, you know, reduces the diameter of it and places along it. Uh, that is still allowed. So you can have a decorative post here made out of a four by four that's less than four inches thick, you know, with the fluting or, you know, whatever the you know, uh, detail on it is. That can be allowed in your opinion if you don't think that column is too weak with the turning that has been done on it uh that it could can be or can be allowed let's put it that way as it says in the in code may be allowed but it cannot be notched to attach to uh the ledger board or joyce or whatever down here uh not on a four by four post so they want the full thickness of that four by four securing our guardrails here or you know normally you shouldn't see a new construction you shouldn't see four by four 
columns uh, coming up from the ground supporting it either. Uh, those are supposed to be six by six nominal now, but or minimum. But uh, for our guardrail posts, no notching on them if they're four by four. So that is a change in the 2021 uh, code or IRC changes. And then you guys all know this, but you know, uh, no more than a four inch gap in the uh, balusters uh, or spindles, whatever you want to call them. Uh, between, so, you know, um, and this goes back, oh goodness, a uh, good 12 plus years. So in the 70s or 80s, I don't see many decks still holding up from the 70s, but occasionally one from the 80s. Uh, they were allowed uh, pre-80s up to 11 inches in the 80s, nine inches, but um, that has been tightened down and you guys all know it, you know, so they figured that a baby's head cannot fit through a gap that is uh, uh, smaller or is four inches or smaller. So <sighs> horizontal balusters or balustrades, as it says here, <sighs> are climbable. So a kid could climb over these. So they're a bad idea, but certainly, for instance, in the Denver metro area, they allow them to do this. It's usually steel cables because it just, I guess they think that's prettier. So you'll st see steel cables running horizontally uh, inside houses too, for that matter. You know, it's climbable, but you know, this is one of those places where at least around here, our local inspectors are uh, making that um, decision between aesthetics and safety and letting aesthetics win the argument. And I know it's done in other places too. So if you're living in one of those places, you're not gonna call out, or in my, if you take my advice, you won't call out horizontal balusters or cabling or something. Uh, I mean, you might make a note that it's climbable and you know, tell your client, you know, be careful with your, you know, your, that four-year-old uh, uh, little uh, boy you have there uh, or, you know, with these climbable uh, uh, ballast or cables here or something. But chances are, uh, most of us are living in places where they're allowing. Okay. Just a little bit, this is from NADRA, uh, National, uh, uh, went blank on it, but they're a deck organization. Uh, they want full, full length nails for these brackets holding on uh, post columns or other things, not the little uh, inch and a half nails, but full 16, uh, 16 penny nails that go completely in, you know, deep into the next piece of wood. So not, now, for our purposes, often we can't see this unless these nails have popped, and so often they have because the short ones are not biting into this uh, lower framing here enough to hold them in place, and so they start coming out. And sometimes, man, you can just grab these things and pull them out with your fingers. They just pop right out. And so we want full-length 16-penny nails, galvanized, uh, used for these attachments. Um, let me back up here, make sure I didn't miss it. Okay. So <sighs> ramps longer than six. So for instance, you have some kind of handicap ramp. If it's longer than six feet, it should also have handrails on the sides. So here's our handrail guidance. Uh, off the nose of the tread, there's your tread. Off the nose of the tread, 36, 34 to 38 inches high and the same height for the entire length. And generally speaking, whichever, if, you, if you're turning some corners, uh, that if, whichever side that handrail's on, let's just say like in our illustration here, the left side, if you're going up the, uh, up the stairs, uh, the, uh, that handrail should stay on the left side through the turns and should be continuous. Uh, as, mu as much as possible. Now, if you have a landing, uh, 
then a ne next set of stairs, you don't have to be continuous through the lane. Um, the, uh, here's a little thing, like say we have this, uh, a chimney here or something and the deck runs up uh, to it. The edge of the decking can extend past that last uh, rim joist, girder, whatever it is here, a, a maximum of six inches. That's a little thing, you know, that, you know, boy, target, there's a misdemeanor, but if you see it sticking out here two feet, well, then this is probably going to be pretty floppy on the end and easy to pick up. Um, so one of these things that uh, just probably not something you're going to be running into very often, but may jump at you is wrong if this distance here is excessive, like you know, 10, 12 inches, uh, then you may be, uh, uh, go, wait a second, what's that rule? <clears throat> Decking should have minimum and maximum one eighth inch gaps between the boards, prevents puddles from falling, uh, from forming bigger than eighth inch gaps. Uh, some shoes, you know, like, uh, you know, like, some high heels, the, the heel on those things are, you know, maybe three eighths of an inch or even less, and they might get stuck in the gap here. So uh, we're looking for eighth inch gaps, uh, minimum and maximum between the planking. Uh, so water can go through, doesn't puddle on it, and other things can't easily get, you know, particularly like high heel shoes get stuck in a bigger gap. Um, offset the, uh, the butt joints or staggering them. Um, the, uh, you know, and they should, I got another illustration here. So they should be staggered to length or two of the uh, joists for good strength. This adds stability to the deck. It helps prevent that wobble or that you know shaky or sh shaking or shimmying that we might run into on uh, on uh, a deck if they you know break them too the butt joints are too close to each other or they do a straight line like you know too many straight lines in a row kind of thing might lead to some destate like this illustration to the uh, up here in the corner uh, can lead to the deck maybe not being as solid feeling when we walk out on it as one where we have good overlaps between the uh, uh, breaks and the planks. A little thing there that we you know, look. If you walk out on this deck and it's rock solid and otherwise looking good and they have this, uh, they dip too many planks, not uh, improperly staggered. Is that something I'm gonna write up? No, I'm not. But if I feel it, if this deck is unstable, it's wobbly, shaky and stuff, and I see this, I'm going to go, uh, and it could be a contributor. So what is somebody going to do? I don't know. They're probably going to come in and brace the heck out of it underneath to stabilize it and leave this alone because it's easier to add stabilization to it than this. But I'm just going to write up uh, uh, the deck is uh, excessively wobble, wobbly or wobbles. Uh, and uh, needs to be stabilized. And oh, as a side note, they didn't stagger the planking like they should. Um, carpet, you know, carpet and decks are not friends. Uh, it not only, as it says there, hides the surface, but particularly on wood decks, it can hold moisture on that deck and severely contribute to not only degradation, but shorten the life of the wood deck. Um, I know you guys have seen it too. You peel that carpet up someplace and the deck is horrible underneath it. It does the same thing to patios many times. So um, the, uh, so yeah, you know, if the carpet, if the carpet's loose enough where I can pick up a corner and kind of lift up and see what's going on, I, I certainly do. If I'm walking across it and I can feel the wood crumbles, underneath the uh, carpet, I'm gonna say, and you know, sometimes you can get underneath it and, and see visually verify that, but if you can't, let's say it's eight inches off the grade, 
uh, <clears throat> but you can feel that kind of crumble uh, the surface of the, of the wood top, the surface underneath the carpet. I'm going to write up the uh, evidence that uh, we have deteriorated uh, wood deck under the carpet. Here's an example. This one's kind of fun. Uh, the dogs, they got big dogs. And this is right in front of the uh, sliding glass door into the house that the dogs come and go. And the dogs have just worn the surface down on the uh, decking and it made uh, screw pops here, uh, or, or looks like pops. But actually, these haven't backed out. The wood's gone away. You know, it's something that barefoot or something that someone could snag themselves on. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm calling that out. I'm writing it up, saying uh, uh, screws are protruding above, uh, are not flush with the surface of the planking, and um, uh, need to be flush with the surface of the planking. Uh, so even though we've lost, uh, you know what, uh, I'm not sure it's quite an eighth of an inch, but lost certainly over a sixteenth of an inch, and eh, maybe close to an eighth, of a wood surface here, the planks themselves are still solid. So I don't have a safety concern yet, but obviously that's something that someone could snag uh, barefoot on in particular if they want on the deck. Uh, whoops, yeah, wait, we already did that. Let's go this way, okay. On stringers, uh, this applies to inside stairs and stuff too. So, <clears throat> notched stringers and generally stair stringers uh, in, in general uh, should be made of a minimum of two by 12 inch lumber if we're using you know regular lumber uh, you know not laminated or anything or something and this throat area between the notch of the tread and the riser here that throat area there should be a uh, five inch at minimum five inches of wood there and so uh, less than that can weaken this if they have if for whatever reason because of the steepness of the stairs or something they had to cut this out deeper um, then they can reinforce this throat area by adding framing you know screwing it in, lagging it in, or, or bolting it in, or something that really truly contributes to the overall strength of the stringer. So they can add like a two by four, three and a half inches thick or wide across this throat area here to reinforce this. But on just a plain two by 12 stringer running here with this nut uh, cut out here, we want at least five inches of wood here so that this stringer is uh, you know, secure uh, or is uh, strong enough to support you know, average people running up and down the string. So this is one of those things that, yeah, I see that violated a few times a year and uh, they didn't, you know, just I just say that throat isn't as uh, wide as it should be and we need a uh, qualified contractor to uh, fix it. And, you know, we're, in general, I think I said this earlier, but I'll say it again. Home inspectors need to tread carefully in prescribing fixes. So even if you know exactly how to fix something, uh, you know, you tell your, your client or whoever, but your client, exactly the best way to fix it. You've given them great advice. You've told them exactly how to do it. Wonderful. But you know, people hear what you say through their own filters of experience, knowledge, and what you said, once it goes through that filter in their ear to their brain, comes out somehow different. And you get that call, you know, a month, two months later, Hey, I uh, fixed that thing just the way you told me to, but it's not working. Oh, what'd you do? They tell you and you go, oh, that isn't the way I told you to do it. Yeah, it is. It's exactly the way I told you to do it. So my two cents, tread very carefully when you start to tell somebody how to fix something. It's just a line I use many times. 
I was in construction for quite a few years, is, you know, once upon a time, I had to figure out how to fix that. But today, all I have to do is point at it and say wrong. It's not copyrighted. If you like it, feel free to use it. Okay. So over here, uh, again, we have a metal bracket that's been repurposed, so to speak. Uh, Joyce hanger in this, uh, uh, not a Joyce hanger, but um, a, a, well, a version of one, I suppose. But they hammered it out. They bent it. <clears throat> they they just changed it from whatever it was designed to do before. You can't do that. So, um, you know, you're going to write it up. Maybe only as a comment, because clearly this is working. It's securing the uh, stringers here to the uh, framing on the uh, deck here. And, you know, these stairs are rock solid. They got a boatload of nails in here, you know, a couple of drywall screws, which, of course, aren't doing anything. Uh, our upper brackets need some additional nails, so I'm calling that out for darn sure, but I'm also making a comment that this me uh, uh, metal bracket has been repurposed and that would uh, go against, uh, or rather, whoever the manufacturer of this is, and they all know, as far as I know, you know, as far as I know, no manufacturer of any of these brackets say you can bend them to any shape you want and we'll still warranty it. That, that just, that doesn't happen. So a couple of things to call out here with the repurposing of the bracket uh, for something that it's not ready to do. Um, they didn't fill all the holes that are supposed to have fasteners in them and they use drywall screws, even if they're the pretty gold ones. Um, for a, a purpose they're not ready for. And the obvious thing is these, you know, these very thin fluted drywall screws don't have any shear strength or very little shear strength. They're, they're not designed to support the pressures of that metal bracket pulling on them. That's just not what their purpose in life. Okay. <clears throat> so strainers should be no more than 16, 18 inches apart for wood decking. Uh, 12 inches for composite. The number of stringers installed at a wood framed stairway is uh, typically related to the uh, minimum 36 inch minimum width. Um, cut stringers are used in stair construction and there must be at least three of them uh, for that 36 inch wide stairs uh, so that we have you know, support. It's properly supported, of course. And um, they obviously that would mean they're not more than six, 18 inches apart. If somebody's doing a four foot stair. Uh, they're probably going to, they need a fourth one in there anyway. They're probably going to evenly space them and do them 12 inches apart. But in any event, 36 inches, the typical minimum width. And we should have that middle stringer running through there. Um, the, uh, so, uh, yeah, you can put these treads, uh, 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 cleats, I mean, underneath the treads. Uh, and commonly done, that leaves the uh, stringer solid wood, which is nice. The catch is how well they attach these uh, cleats or ledger strips, they're sometimes called. And yeah, you know, sometimes we see those breaking, coming apart, deteriorated, and that's a defect we're going to write up. If they mortise out the ledger, uh, which when I built decks all those years ago was my favorite way of doing it because I like leaving all the wood here. So I would mortise out my ledger, stick my tread in there, and then uh, attach <clears throat> through on the ends to the uh, ledger. Uh, you know, in hindsight, I now know that wasn't the best practice because once again, I'm running screws into the end grain here so that it's actually doing the combination of mortising out, mortising, I think I've said mortaring, mortis, mortising out our stringer here with a cleat under it also uh, because now we're not relying strictly on screws going into the end grain here to support 
this ledger or or this uh, tread here, we also have the cleat there. So it's a combination of mortise and cleat that is best or strongest. Ah, the four inch sphere. So most deck stairs um, have open risers. Around here, they quit allowing that. That may be true where you are too, but uh, for decks built now, certainly under the 2021 code changes, uh, they want to see a riser here. They don't want to see air through here at all. Uh, so they're, it's solid, period. So we don't have to worry about just four in, having only four inch steps here. Go, or, uh, do, uh, say four and three quarters or uh, four or five inch if you have four inch there and one inch of tread. Uh, the, uh, so, but in any event, the idea obviously is so, uh, little babies that might be trying to negotiate the stairs here somehow uh, can't go through the back of a uh, of the open thing, either closed off with a riser or less than four inches, four inches or less. <clears throat> um, minimum tread depth, that depth, 10 inches minimum. Uh, and uh, maximum riser height, seven and three quarters with no more than three eighths inch variance between the steps. Think about how our brain works. When our foot lands on that first step, it programs our brain for the height of that step. And our brain subconsciously is expecting the next step to be the same height. So if this is more than a three eighths inch variance, there is a trip hazard on these stairs. Now, if I visually see something that's way uneven, uh, usually I don't even need to put a tape on it. I just know it's very, got a variation of more than three eighths of an inch and I'm calling it out. Uh, but, um, you know, maybe take a photo with the tape on it showing what I'm talking about, but, but I can see it. But a little trick that has worked for me over the years is when I'm going up these steps, if I trip on one of them, I instantly go, why did I trip on that? And I'm telling you, nearly every time when I put a tape on it, I'm going to have, it's going to be three-eighths of an inch or more, more than three-eighths of an inch out of uh, height variance, so to speak, with the other treads. And that was why I tripped on it. So just one of those little, I don't know if you call it a trick, but little things that I've learned over the years that uh, when I'm going upstairs, not just decks, but in houses, you name it, basements, wherever. <clears throat> if I trip on a tread, I immediately go, oh, well, I shouldn't have done that. Well, what's going on here? And put a tape on it and find out um, they're, they're not the same height within three eighths inch variance going up. And now I write that up as a trip hazard. Um, we've already talked about um, height there off the nose, 34 to 38 inches. Um, interesting. So this image here, and this is right out, this is an Internachi, uh, you know, image, as you can see. But it shows a like a, a two by six, you know, sometimes two by fours, but they seem to always nearly always be two by sixes here. <clears throat> so, yeah, you can put your hand around the edge here. But that is not considered graspable under the definition, so to speak. So, be flat board up here to set your, you know, your beer or your coke up here uh, when you're out on your deck. But on the handrails going down the stairs, we want our hand to grasp that, you know, edge of the handrail and be able to just slide it right up it without ever anything interfering with our hand going up it. This is true inside houses too and stuff. So we need that continuous smooth uh, rail that we're sliding our hand along uh, the whole way so that we always have something right there that we can readily grasp. So also, also, also on that, oops, like that, um, the, uh, whoops, uh, we have the uh, 
inch and a half uh, here to a finger groove here to make it a graspable handrail there. Um, the uh, uh, over here have a different type, but we still have the finger groove there for making it graspable. And then we want at least an inch and a half of clearance here for our knuckles to roll over the edge here. And no, no pinch points as we go up and down the stairs. So, um, you know, it's a uh, uh, something that, you know, not putting a tape on this, but when I, you know, put my hand on a handrail, wherever it is, deck or inside a house or something, and my knuckles are scraping, I'm like, oh, wait, that's wrong. Uh, call this out because you need that clear gap there to uh, uh, for our hand to have a full grasp on that handrail on the stairs. Okay. Um, <clears throat> five foot maximum between posts. Uh, that's for uh, strength uh, on our hand on our uh, handrails going up. So uh, if we have a post every five feet, it's properly secured to the stringers with all the rules that, you know, with appropriate brackets or bolting or whatever, uh, where it's good and solid. Uh, we want that nice and solid. Little wobble, you know, is, you know, you, little wobble is except in fact, almost unavoidable. You're gonna have a little wobble, but if you push on that, and it just doesn't feel good, you know, I'm gonna write it up. Um, but we're looking for five foot maximum between the posts. Uh, interestingly, on stairs, little variance on this uh, um, gap between the balusters or the spindles <clears throat> is on stairs, we're allowed up to four and three eighths inches and then in this triangle right here, formed by the riser and the tread in the bottom of our, uh, in this case, we have a rail running along the bottom of our guard or handrail here. We have a bottom rail. We're allowed a six inch uh, ball to pass through there. It's just uh, kind of uh, understanding the, 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 uh, the math the geometry of building stairs. And so they do, they allow up to six inches in that gap right there. I don't know why they go to four and three eighths on the uh, on the handrail going up or down the stairs, but they do. But this one is just recognizing the geometry involved in building stairs. Okay, <clears throat> we talked about this uh, earlier, but I'll, hit it again, is uh, the guardrail must resist 200 pounds of push away toward the edge of the deck, out, outward. In other words, the old rule was resistance in any direction. So we don't care if it's kind of sloppy coming in, although I gotta say, if I push out on it and it doesn't budge, I haven't had one that just will fold in. You know, they're usually, good in all directions or they're lousy in all directions but under the new 2021 change all we have to do is push out on it and uh and we're not concerned if it's sloppy pulling it in okay <sighs> plastic composite and other materials used as guards shall comply with irc requirements this is kind of a very poorly described thing in the IRC. But guys, you're looking at this uh, synthetic uh, material here. Oh, you know, it's coming apart. It's in, it's in bad shape. You know, you're gonna write it up, uh, the, the lousy condition of it. Um, little other little things here. Outlet uh, must be GFCI. Uh, if it's a really old house with an old deck, uh, could be grandfathered in, but we're, me, I'm still going to make a recommendation that it be changed to GFCI, but anything done in the last, uh, what is it, 25 or so years, can't remember the exact date, um, should be GFCI 
and and today and in the last uh, 10 12 years have an all-weather cover where you can see that slot there where you can plug a cord into it and still the cover goes down over the cord so one of those bubble covers or <clears throat> or expanding covers uh you know accordion covers one something like that that uh, protects the outlet and then uh this little uh little detail here the receptacle outlet shall not be located more than six and a half feet above the balcony deck or porch walking surface so you know if the only outlet here is seven feet up the wall it's wrong um it's it's got to be within and i don't know why they picked six and a half feet exactly but uh six it's got to be at least six and a half feet above the surface of the deck so obviously this outlet beautiful it's I don't know what eight inches off the deck 10 inches off but i gotta say i haven't run into this i don't think ever um that the outlet is too far off the deck but for whatever reason there is a code for that and if you walk out on a deck and you go why is the outlet way up there maybe you'll it'll ping this memory here and you'll go wait a second i need to put a you know, look if you're six foot tall and it's uh, um you know a foot over your head you're going to go okay that's too tall and uh we got something wrong there okay uh no septic tanks under the deck uh you know uh you know if you have uh like it's a basement uh, uh, let's say this is a basement area right here, uh, and your only egress from that bedroom, for instance, is under the deck. You got to be able to get out. If somebody, you know, added a section of deck, for instance, over an egress window that prevents easy escape out of here, well, yeah, that's a big one. You're gonna write that up. Um, you know, you see them built over regular basement window wells and stuff, but those are not egress windows anyway. But if it is a true, you know, conforming egress window, then that access to get out of there has to be open all the way out somehow. So to put a deck over it, it better be high enough that you can no problem, no sweat, get out the window under the deck and out in a way. Okay. A couple of little things on looking at uh, decks. Start by looking at the underside, you know, checking the ledger, the flashing, the framing, and fasteners, wood, looking for wood damage, rot, maybe probing something, uh, tapping suspicious wood. And you know, by tapping, like I take my big screwdriver, but take the head of that screwdriver and tap a board, uh, if it's solid, you know, you get that hot, solid knot. If it's rotted out, it sounds like I'm hitting a piece of styrofoam. Uh, push on columns and posts. They should be solid. You know, if they swing away, we've got a problem. I mean, that's true on porch covers. Uh, if you're in uh, basements or uh, particularly crawl spaces, how many times in a crawl space you push on some wood column or occasionally a steel column there and just slides or it's loose oops um as you walk across the deck uh look at it peel and finish uh loose fasteners loose and warped damaged decks rotted wood rough finish all those things are defects that you're going to call out and you know depending on what you're seeing assign you know, levels of uh, you know misdemeanor or felony to it maybe uh, Push hard and outward and downward on that guardrail or handrail. So, I mean, with 200 pounds, giving it a good hard push. Uh, check your baluster widths and other openings. And, you know, like my fist is right around, right at four inches. So, it's pretty easy for me to just kind of use my fist to uh, check those balusters. If you, you're built this way and that's convenient, that's an easy way to check it. Just and then after you've done it for a long time, you can kind of visually pretty much go right. You know, that gap's four and a quarter. Um, the uh, and then just are you comfortable? You know, you're walking across the deck. 
feels good to you, you're solid, what's the problem? You walk out on it and you get that little, you know, butterfly feeling in your stomach because it's wobbly, it shifts or something else. Now you're going to be critical of the other defects. More, in my opinion, I'm going to be more critical of the defects that I'm running into uh, with that deck. Um, you know, <sighs> evidence of non-compliant work or modifications completed without required permits or inspections. Uh, this is kind of a phrase that I use in my reports. Uh, and then that next one down there is a phrase also that I use often in reports. Uh, you know, you can, you know, if, if you like it, great, feel free to use it or something similar. If you don't, that's okay too. You know, like I said, you don't offend me if you don't agree with my subjective, uh, uh, you know, some of the subjective things I'm saying here. But not constructed the best practices. Man, oh man. Over and over. Honest to goodness. Uh, how many decks do you see that are constructed the best practices? Yeah, they're the term, another great term, performing but not conforming. Um, man, you run into that kind of thing a lot. Um, so yeah, you're writing up some defects, but look, yeah, you know, it's not failing, it's not going to fall apart or something, but, you know, man, it, it still wasn't done to code compliances and or best practices. So, you know, not every inspector agrees with this, and that's fine. I don't use the code word in my reports. I use terms like not compliant with uh, standards or not best practices. So that's the language that I typically use in the way I write things. <clears throat> so that bottom phrase there, not constructed the best practices is common, sometimes subjective, and is an indication that work was not compliant with the standards of the time uh, done with the required construction permits. In the inspector's estimation, the framing should have been better secured together with approved strapping, brackets, hangers, fasteners, and with appropriate flashings. There may be other work that could have been done better. Unless otherwise noted here, decks not built the best practice or local standards may be usable at the time of the inspection, but remedial work is recommended by a qualified contractor to ensure that the deck continues to be safely serviceable. That is a phrase that I have in reports constantly. So, uh, wow, that's it. We got to the end. Uh, we, you know, uh, Let's see, let's see. Uh, any more? If it's climbable, I always call it out. But fair enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I make a note that it's climbable. I don't call it out uh, as because the city guys permitted it, allowed it. It's like, well, it's not a code violation. I mean, it is an IRC violation, but it's not a violation as the loc as our local inspectors are interpreting it. So, uh, so I just make a note, it's climbable, you know, you know, be careful, uh, you know, with small kids and, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who maybe have had a couple of drinks that more than they should have or something like that, you know, but it's, uh, but yeah, no, I, I get it. Uh, it's, you know, you, it's, you, you, you think it's something that you, and I got a buddy who always calls them out too. And, uh, you know, nothing wrong with that because it is easily arguable that it's a safety issue for sure. Um, and uh, uh, one, one guy says, care and consideration advised. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, guys, a lot of what we do is uh, still done within our subjective uh, opinions based on our what we know and what our experiences are. And so the, uh, you know, not, it's not connected with decks, but I have a piece of uh, corrugated stainless steel tubing, gas, you know, CSST, where lightning burned a hole through it. And so 
you know, I got a piece from an actual house where a lightning strike 200 feet from the house energized the gas line. A million volts of electricity jumped out of the CSST onto the I-beam and filled the house with gas. Luckily, it didn't catch on fire, but I have an actual piece of that. And I, and I got, so for me, I'm like, wow, that's going to be a big deal to me when I uh, don't see yellow CSST bonded to a ground source. So for me, personally, I probably make a bigger deal out of it than maybe some other guys do who just know, oh, yellow CSST should be bonded to a ground source. It's not that different than what we're talking about here on DEX. You know, many of us have some experiences that we go, wow, you know, this is a, I'm going to call this out, climbable. If you've ever seen somebody fall over, a, a, you know, the horizontal balusters or cabling on a, on a stairs, then wow, you know, you're going to go, I've seen that happen. You know, it's a big deal to me. So things like that. Um, the uh, guy, uh, one guy, Bruce says, I expect like my family will be living there. That's a great way to go. I mean, that's a great way to go. So guys, uh, we've met the requirements uh, time-wise of uh, for New Yorkers. So for you New Yorkers who want credit for this program, for this uh, uh, webinar here, uh, Email your information or that you were here and stuff to Kayla at uh, what is it, Kayla at internachi.org. Um, to Kayla, K A E L A, um, and uh, she'll get you the credits you need. Uh, we this, if you're in a different state and uh, you're looking for credit, check with Kayla because this uh, could be approved in some other states, but it's uh, we put this together. Uh, I don't know what some months ago, specifically for New Yorkers. And we got inquiries and interest from some guys in other states. So um, they, uh, uh, you know, so it may be approved in some other states, but check with Kayla if uh, to see if that uh, uh, is the case for you if you're not in New York. So uh, with that, uh, you know, guys, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. And, um, you know, good luck uh, uh, in the business here. And, and uh, that, that's basically all I have. Thank you very much. Hi.